Welcome to the Spring 2024 AS Sessions, Session 4, uh, with myself, um, Mr Black from Penglai School, from Penglai Smith. Okay, so as you can see, this is the final session, and we're going to be looking today at another practical from your um, course, and we're specifically looking at how to make up a standard solution. And we're also going to look <clears throat> at um, the titration to standardize another solution. And we're going to look at some of the you know, issues with this experiment, the kind of percentage error things that we need to take into account. When we're doing uh, quoting values. All right, so we'll, we'll get started on the presentation then. So as you can see, yeah, session four, and this is the practical we're going to be going over today. So if you have got your practical book uh, from when you've been doing your course, it might be worthwhile kind of being able to refer to it. A bit, I have got the, um, you know, most of the content in the slides anyway. So as you see uh, in this practical, we're looking at standardizing an acid solution, uh, in this case, hydrochloric acid. And to do that, we're gonna be using some anhydrous sodium carbonate. So, I need a background to, to the practical because I think it's important why we're doing things. So we're going to ask ourselves the question, what is standardization and why is it necessary? OK, so OK, why do we need to have a standard solution of HCl? Why does it have to be standardized? What do we use HCl for? Well, usually we're using it to you know, find out the concentration of other things, like, for example, a base. And we'd use a, like a, the HCl to do our titration with. And the problem with um, the HCl that you'll typically be using is it's going to come in a bottle like this. All right. So typically, if you order hydrochloric acid from a technician, you'll get the lab reagent and it will be marked up as 0.1 molar HCl. Now, the accuracy there <clears throat> for our titration isn't good enough. OK. Um, typically, if you're doing a, a titration with HCl, you'll need to know more precise um, concentration, for example, uh, a more precise concentration there. All right, so it's not 0 0.1 molar, it's actually 0 0.0988 moles per decimeter cubed. And that way our uh, moles um, calculations are a lot more accurate. Right, so um, we're going to standardize our HCl with some sodium carbonate. And I'm just going to talk to you about what you use to standardize something. OK, so the first question is, well, you know, why? Why do you, would you bother having to standardize it with some sodium carbonate? Why, why not just make up a standard solution of HCl? And I'm going to go with, uh, through how you make a standard solution a bit later today with you. OK, but if you want to make a standard solution, um, one of the things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to weigh it a precise amount. <clears throat> That's going to be difficult weighing out hydrochloric acid, concentrate hydrochloric acid. It is extremely soluble. Uh, it's actually very exothermic, it's also a problem. Uh, there's just all sorts of wrong with making up a standard solution of HCl. Um, but there's a massive issue with making a standard solution of HCl as well. And that's the fact how HCl comes to us. So typically when we order chemicals, um, concentrate hydrochloric acid and we dilute it down to its different concentrations. The issue we have with HCl is that <clears throat> what we buy we buy the concentrated stuff it's got a, a, a rough molarity and it can range from anywhere between you can see here 10 to 12 molar so we don't actually know what that concentration is we have to actually standardize that solution we have to say what the concentration is all right so that's that's the reason that we're going to have standardized hcl when we make up a solution of hcl typically if it's a bench bench grade you know we don't need a specific concentration we're not using it for titration that's okay we can just make up a solution and it will be about one molar but it won't be one molar okay uh, but if you're doing a titration this is a quantitative thing you need a precise concentration this is where it has to be standardized okay so the, the next question is, well, why why do we particularly choose some like sodium carbonate? So I want to know, want you to know that sodium carbonate would be a good what's called a primary standard, something that we can standardize other solutions against. So why choose some like sodium carbonate? You know, you could typically why not use sodium hydroxide? So you could make a standard solution of sodium hydroxide and use that. 
And, you know, sodium hydroxide, yeah, you could potentially do that, but there are issues with sodium hydroxide, as you'll see here. OK, so have a quick read of that and I'll go through some of the things with you. All right, so one of the issues with sodium hydroxide is its purity. OK, um, sodium hydroxide itself needs standardising and that's because it goes off. And I tried to get a good photo of this to show you, but um, it's quite difficult to find one on the web. But if ever you look at a bottle of sodium hydroxide, one of the things you'll notice is that there's a chalky residue all around the lid. Um, it can be quite substantial, actually. And if a bottle has been standing for a while, you'll also see there's little white flakes in the bottom of the, uh, the solution. So that's generally not showing that it's particularly um, pure. There's something going on here, right? And it, basically sodium hydroxide goes off. And if you look here, we need something that's uh, stable. And sodium hydroxide, unfortunately, reacts with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And what I'm going to get you to do is I'm going to try and think about um, what's going on. So what's forming? All right. Well, hopefully you can use a bit of, you know, common sense. So what, what forms here? Then these two react. One of the things they form is sodium carbonate. Now, another product form, but before we think about the other products, I'm just going to get you to um, do a bit of balance in there. There's one obvious thing that needs sorting, and that's the sodiums. So let's get that balanced up. OK. And now I'm going to ask you to think about the other products. Look at your balanced equation and you should hopefully see there's another product that's going to form. OK, so if we look at the options, we've got four options on this side and we've got three on this side. And we've also got some hydrogens as well. We've got uh, two hydrogens here and on this side there's no hydrogens. Everything else is good. Sodium's good. OK, so you don't need to worry about that. So, oh, and the, the carbon's obviously good as well. So we've got two extra hydrogens on this side and an extra oxygen. Yeah, you guessed it. We're going to make some water. So this is what's happening to our sodium hydroxide. It does go off. That's why it's not a good primary standard. Um, there's another issue as well with sodium um, hydroxide as a primary standard, and it's its MR. MR is 40.1. What's the issue with that? Well, um, the lower the MR, the the, the bigger the air in weighing. OK, so ideally with a primary standard, you want as big an NMR as possible. Uh, effectively, if you double the MR, you have the air in weighing. OK, so the bigger the MR, the less air in weighing that you have. So that's why we've chosen our uh, sodium carbonate as our primary standard. Um, also, um, we've got to think about dissolving. Does our primary standard dissolving? Sodium hydroxide, yeah, it's really, really good at dissolving, so that wouldn't be an issue. But we've already seen there are issues with the purity, the stability, the um, MR. OK. So in summary, that is why we're having to standardise the hydrochloric acid, and that is why we're using sodium carbonate to do that for us. OK, so let's talk then about making up our standard solution of sodium carbonate, which we'll then use to titrate with the hydrochloric acid. So you can see here, um, we've got a set of results. Um, I've mentioned this before in previous sessions, but I'll mention it again. You can, this phrase here is very strange, uh, accurately weigh out approximately. OK, so what that means is you need to get about 2.75 grams, um, but you need to weigh that 2.75 grams really accurately. OK, so you're going to have to use an accurate balance. OK, so what we're going to do then is um, we've got some results here and you can see that I've got the mass of both and contents and then I've emptied the contents into my beaker to make my standard solution. I've got the mass empty boat. So just very quickly, the calculator, which is also going to be very handy for you today. Can you just work out the mass of carbonate that we've got for our standard solution? This is what we call the weighing by difference method. And if you watch the uh, I think it was session one or session two that I did, yeah, session two, uh, gravimetric analysis, I go through the weighing by difference method and how important it is. OK, the reason we do this weighing by difference, as I said on the gravimetric analysis presentation, um, if you don't do weighing by difference, then basically you're not going to be transferring all your solid into your standard solution. OK, so there we are. Once we've done our weighing by difference method, we know that we've transferred 2.7505 grams into our beaker to make our standard solution up. 
So that's our accurately mass, approximately 2.75 grams weighed accurately. All right, so how do we make our standard solution then? Really important that you can talk about this to an examiner. OK, so it could be a six mark question and they'll literally say, how would you make a standard solution? May involve a calculation as well, but we're going to cover that. So you've got your um, accurately weighed mass. Um, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to dissolve it, but you're not going to dissolve it into your volumetric flask. The first thing you need to say to the examiner is you're going to dissolve it in a small amount of water, certainly smaller than uh, 250 centimetres cubed in a beaker. And this is the stage that I quite often see people rush in. Don't rush it. Make sure it's all dissolved because once it goes to the volumetric flask, you are going to have a much harder time getting any little bit of solid to dissolve. So you have to stir it really well. Don't splash. <laughs> you splash, you're starting again. All right. So don't do vigorous stirring. Just, you know, take time. Don't rush. Make sure it all dissolves. And typically I'll use anything from 100 to 150 centimetres cubed, even perhaps 200 centimetres cubed if I'm going for a 250 mil standard solution, which typically I am. Once it's fully dissolved then, what we do is we transfer that into our volumetric flask. Okay, and you can see here there's plenty of room to add more liquid. And we do need to add more liquid because the next thing we need to do is we need to ensure that all our dissolved solid is transferred to volumetric flask, which is where we come into this stage here, which is the rinsing stage. So what we're doing is we're taking our distilled water and we're just rinsing the sides of our beaker and then pouring that residue or that solu um, solution into our volumetric flask. We're rinsing the funnel as well. I typically do two or three rinsings, you know, and basically what I do is I get that solution all the way up towards this line but not on that line. So typically I'll stop, let's say the line is just where that funnel mark is, I'll stop it around this region. Okay, what I do then is, and they've not said that here, and I've not said it in any of the methods, but I'm sure you do this yourself. I make up the, the final part of this, um, getting to the line with a dropping pipette. So I'll get some distilled water in my beaker and I'll just transfer little bits across until I'm exactly bottom of the meniscus, okay? You can see here. That's where you're done. And there's your standard solution. Well, nearly. So there you go. There's the uh, rest of the method for making your standard solution up of the sodium carbonate. And um, there's just one thing that I think is really important. Um, I think, oh yes, they have they have said it here. Shake the mixture thoroughly. Okay, so don't forget once you made your standard solution, you'll probably feel quite you know please that you got to that stage. Uh, it's really important that what we do at that stage then is we just turn the flask upside down, give it a little bit of a shake. Just make sure that your you know, solutions are mixing, because if you don't do that, you'll have a low concentration here and you'll have a gradient of increasing concentration here. OK, so by mixing, then you've got uniform concentration. Which is what we want for our standard solution. OK, so what we're going to do now then is um, quick calculation uh, to find the concentration of the sodium carbonate solution. I'm just going to pause there. So you can do that. Don't worry if you can't do it, then I'm just going to go through that with you now, but hopefully that's something you can do. OK, so if we're looking for concentration, we need to think about our formula triangles. So hopefully you've come up with this formula triangle. Um, I always write this formula triangle down. Anytime I'm doing a concentration uh, calculation, that formula triangle goes down the side because my brain gets things mixed up. All right, so by writing that form triangle there, I'm not going to make silly mistakes as I'm trying to do other things. So to work out our concentration, we take our moles and we divide by the volume. Obviously, we don't have the moles yet. OK, so we're going to have to work that out first. So how do we work out our moles of the sodium carbonate? Well, we have the mass. We know the MR. And it's quite easy to work out. So we use this formula triangle, which you should also be familiar with. Mass over the formula or atomic mass, so formula mass in our case. So you should have worked that out, first of all, actually moles of sodium carbonate. I'm just going to point out to you, by the way, in terms of working out, I wouldn't write all those values. All right, I would write that to three significant figures. Significant figure one, significant figure two, significant figure three. OK, and then I would be uh, rounding at that point. So in terms of working out, I'd be writing 0 0.0259. I certainly wouldn't write all those values. However, I would keep all those values on my calculator. 
never ever ever get rid of those values you need them okay if you round too soon the calculation then you're going to start losing marks so keep on the calculate but you don't need to write them all down for your working guide okay so there's our concentration okay you can see that i've written it down in the way that i've shown working guide and what we're doing next then is work out our concentration now we've got the moles i'll let you do that very quickly um Another little error I sometimes see from our pupils, forget to divide the volume by a thousand. OK, so make sure you do that. If it's in centimetres cubed or mil, then divide by a thousand. So there we've got our concentration. Again, I'm keeping that value on my calculator. That's not going anywhere. OK, um, that's been come from this value, not from that value. I'm going to keep this value. OK, but in my working out, you can see that again, I've quoted three significant figures. Just pointing out, by the way, significant figures, one, two, three, don't truncate. Um, it will drive examiners mad. It's not 0 0.103, you would lose a mark for that. We need to look at the digit before. I know I'm telling you stuff you already know, uh, and round up the three to a four. Great, so we've now got our concentration of our standard solution. And we're gonna be using that value in our titration in a moment. So part two then, this is our titration. Now I'm just gonna talk to you very quickly about rinsing. I've put that there for me to remind myself to talk to you about it. Um, you need to know um, what to rinse uh, your equipment out with. So the, the rule is you rinse out the burette with what's going in the burette and you'll rinse out a pipette with whatever's going in the pipette. So for our case, we'll be rinsing our uh, burette out with HCl and be rinsing our um, pipette out with sodium carbonate standard solution. So that's just something to point out to your conical flask, by the way, um, obviously um, that's where our reaction is going to be taking place on neutralization. We will be just rinsing that out with water. OK, so distilled water in the conical. Good. OK, so let's talk about reading a burette. Um, you've got to be eye level. Um, if ever you're using a burette, just have a quick look to the effect of changing your height has on the um, where you see the bottom of the meniscus. We call that parallax or just eye level reading. All right. Um, what I'm going to do just very quickly is tell me or have a look at my burette there. What's the uh, volume of acid that has been added from that burette? And hopefully you've said 34.4 mil. Well, actually, hopefully you haven't said 34.4 mil because I have an issue with this and an examiner would have an issue with it as well. That's wrong. Okay, you don't want to write that down. You want to write down is taking into account the uncertainty. All right, now the uncertainty is what we can quote to. And what we tend to say in the WJC is that um, when we look at uncertainty of a reading, we can actually plus or minus half the smallest division. Okay, so we can actually quote this to 34.40 mil, and that is what you would want to write down as a result in a results table. Now, if you put 34.4 mil, you probably lose a mark. So remember, when you're recording uh, tighter readings on a table, it's when you're doing the experiment, always record to 0 0.00 or 0 0.05. So just very quick practice for you there. What are your tighter readings? OK, so if we look at the first one. Got 22. My eyesight's really, really bad, but I'm reading that as 22.2. Yeah, zero. And then we've got this one here. So we're at 24. Point, I'm going to say that's a one, that's a two. I'm going to go for 24.3, 24.4, 24. Ah, no, see? So sometimes it's worthwhile just double checking further on. So you can actually go back as well. So that'd be 24.5. 24.4, uh, 24.3. So this is actually 24.20. And we get to this one. This one's quite a nice, easy one to read. OK, so here at 30.05, not 30.05, sorry. That is at 30.50. OK, so 30.50. Right, moving on. So we know how to read a view rep. I'm sure you already do, but we don't assume. So we're going to do our titration then. And what we're going to be doing our titration, we're going to take our standard solution now, which is our sodium carbonate. 
we're going to add that into a uh, conical flask with our methyl orange indicator and we're going to be adding our um, acid to this and we're going to look for our indicator to indicate our endpoint of our titration where we'll see it go to a pink red colour and we'll talk about that a bit later. Really important you've got that white tile there so you've got that, that white background to judge against. So let's go on. So recording results. Um, examiners this year um, and the 2023 paper really were not very happy with um, how year 13s were recording results. Um, so that's something for you to think about going into year 13 and should be thinking about it in your year 12. So if we were doing a tighter titration, we we're going to keep doing our repeat readings. You need to know how to present the results in a format the examiner's going to like. So if you look in the uh, the um, examine, um the practical ta uh, workbook you have, you'll see that there's a table there on the unit, uh, the AS um, booklet. And that's a typical kind of thing you want there. OK, so we've got um, the tighter. So we've got rain, the range finder, one, two, three. And then we've got the volumes uh, involved. So you've got your start volume, your end volume, and then the actual volume used. I've got my units there. OK, so I've put my units here. So these are my values. So I'm going to talk about these now. OK, so. First of all, hopefully you spotted uh, an issue in my results. I told you earlier, um, maybe didn't spot it, but certainly don't make a mistake. Shouldn't be right, and that's 24.1. You know, it's the, the examiner would ask you, is it 24.10 or 24.15? So it's actually 24.10, and this one is 23.30. So that's the first thing to point out about that. And then we're going to work out our mean. Now, we've got four results here. So we add all four up and divide by four, or we're not, are we? OK, because if you remember, and you look at the practical, it says we need concordant results. So important that you know what a concordant result means. So in the exam, you could be asked, what does the term concordant mean? I have seen it as a paper, as a question. So concordant results are results that are within 0 0.20 centimetres cubed of each other, which we can see here. These results are within 0.2. So these three results are concordant. This result here isn't concordant. And to be honest, you won't be including this first result anyway. It's our range finder. Now, what are range finders for? They're to find an approximate val uh, volume of um, reagent needed. Uh, so you can speed up subsequent um, titrations. And you are sometimes asked, what's the purpose of the range finder? So as I say, range finder it gives you an approximate value of reagent needed so that subsequent titrations can be sped up. It's just one of those things to learn. And I'll work out our mean then. As I say, we're not going to include our range uh, finder in here. It's not a concordant result. OK, um, I have seen papers where they don't say it's a range finder. They just give it as reading one. Um, but you can see it's region one's definitely not concordant with the other results, and that's probably because it was a range finder. So we've got a mean tight of I here of 23.22 mil of hydrochloric acid needed to react with our sodium carbonate. OK. So next thing then, we've got our standard solution. And we've done our titration with it. Let's think about our titration. And we have got 25 centimetres cubed a sodium carbonate solution in our conical flask and we've got some methyl indicator in there and we know the concentration of sodium carbonate okay because we made that standard solution up so the first thing i ask you to do is well you tell me what you're going to do well hopefully you've said that you're going to work out the uh, moles of sodium carbonate in that conical flask there's your formula okay that's the formula triangle and you can see there, then we've got 0 0.0026 mole in that conical. OK, and now this is the moles of the sodium carbonate. OK, so we've got that in our conical flask. We've got our methyl orange indicator in there. You can see actually the indicator is now yellow, and that's because we're actually in an alkaline solution. So the next thing we're going to be doing then is we're going to be adding our hydrochloric acid. Okay. And we're going to have this reaction take place with our sodium carbonate and hydrochloric. And 
After 23.22 mil, so this is going to stay pretty much this colour all the way up to 23.22 mil. What you will notice is you'll start to see uh, kind of like a pinky colour start to appear in your solution, as, but as you swirl it around, that will disappear. But when we get to 23.22 mil, okay, we get this colour up here. Okay, this is our end point. We now know that we've added just the right amount of hydrochloric acid to the sodium carbonate. All right, so what's next then? Well, I want you to have a little think. So I'm going to do a pause. I'm going to wait for you to just work out what you're going to do. OK, I'm just going to carry on. So, yeah, hopefully uh, you've decided that you're going to work out how many moles of hydrochloric acid have been added from the burette. So how can you do that? All right, well, we know how many moles of sodium carbonate we've got in our conical flask. 0 0.0026 mol. Now you're going to use the bounced equation, as you always do. Once you know the moles of one thing, you can know the moles of everything. So we know we've got 0 0.0026 mol sodium carbonate. So hopefully you now know how many moles of HCl you added from the burette. You're going to need double that amount. Okay, so you're going to end up of having adding 0 0.0052 mol. An important thing for you to realise is that now we can work out our concentration of HCl. So why, why can we do that? Well, we know that we've added that many moles into our sodium carbonate. We had to. And we also know what volume is required to do that. So we can work out concentration of HCl. So I'm going to, again, ask you to just pause and do that. There's our formula triangle. There's our values. So we know how many moles we've added, and we know the volume that we needed to add to get that many moles. We come out with the concentration here. OK, and again, you know, we've got lots of significant figures, and I'm going to talk about how to deal with these significant figures now. Okay. So I won't record my uh, concentration down to that um, accuracy because my precision, I don't have that um, ability to do that because we need to consider our percentage error. OK, we have to quote our value to percentage to our percentage error. So let's have a quick look at that. This is in your prep book. I have mentioned it on um, other presentations. OK, so this is the bit we need to consider here. Um, the, num the percentage error dictates the um, number of significant figures we can quote to. So we'll just do a quick calculation now to see what our percentage error is. And I'll go for the basic ideas of percentage error again. OK. So, air in weighing. So, the air in weighing. First of all, we need to consider the um, what we call the uncertainty in our equipment. And you can see here it's plus or minus half the smallest division. So, if you think about the weighing, our uncertainty, because we could measure to four decimal places, our precision of air, uh, our uncertainty then is there. Okay. So, now we're going to do our calculation. We're doing our calculation is we look at the um, uncertainty, and then as I've said to you on previous um, presentations, we have to double that. And the reason we're doubling it is because we take two readings: we take the start volume and the final volume, and that gives us a very, 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 very small percentage error because because we use such an accurate scale, you know, it measures the four decimal places. This has got very, very little percentage error, so it's not really anything for us to consider. So um, what we're going to do is we actually look at the Titan. Unfortunately, this was meant to come up secondly. So, OK, air in tighter. So you can see here um, the uncertainty is 0 0.05 mil. And the reason for our uncertainty means 0 0.05 mil is the divisions on the burette. So they are 0.1 divisions. So your uncertainty is half of that like 0 0.05 mil. Again, you can see I've times it by two because we take two readings and I divide it by the actual volume. And that gives us an error of 0.43%. So if we go back now to our, um, we can quote to, oh, bear me a second, go back a slide or two. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so 
0.4%. You know, you could quote four, you could quote three. So I'd probably err on the side of quoting to three significant figures, possibly actually the four significant figures. Yeah, so I'd quote to four significant figures for that, that concentration. So there you go. So we've worked out now the hydrochloric acid. And now what we can do with that hydrochloric acid is we could use that to standardise a sodium hydroxide solution maybe, or we could go and to standardise anything that would react with hydrochloric acid. And we have our accurately known concentration. So I'm just going to go through um, a couple of little bits here in terms of um, errors, because quite often in exam paper questions, you'll be asked about error. So one of the um, main errors that you'll have when you're doing a titration is the uh, what's called overshooting. All right, so overshooting the endpoint, and that's a good one to quote when you ask what are potential, potential errors in the experiment. OK, so if you look at the R titration, we have the sodium carbonate in here. And methyl orange is yellow when it's in alkaline solutions. So, yeah. And what you can see then is that this is our endpoint. So this is where it's just turned acidic. And the overshooting here is where it's gone too red. And whenever I watch people doing titrations, it's one of the things I often pick them up on. It's like, well, that's, you know, you've, you've overshot the endpoint. And I want you to just consider what effect that would have in terms of the concentration you quote. Would your concentration be too high or would it be too low? So I'm just going to give you a little pause. OK, so if you got to this point, you've added more acid than you actually require. All right, so you've got more acid in than you actually require. I'm just going to go back to our calculation. OK, so what that would mean is when you work out your concentration of HCl, you'd be using a bigger value here. OK, and uh, the result using a bigger value there is that your concentration is going to look lower than it actually is. OK, so if you use more acid, it looks like your concentration is actually going to come out lower than it actually is meant to be. OK, so that's one thing. And you always need to, when you're doing these, consider what the effect of the, um, you know, the error, the, the error in your um, practical procedure might have. So here's another uh, thing that I see quite often when we're doing this uh, as a practical. Uh, we've got the conical, um, the um, funnel being left in the burette. OK, so what, what do you think the potential issue with leaving the front of the burette might be? Well, the obvious thing that's going to happen is that we're going to um, add a little bit more acid into our burette. OK, so what could happen is you get little droplets of hydrochloric acid on here, and these could just drip down into our kind of into our burette. I'm getting my equipment names mixed up now. And what that what effect would that have on our um, concentration? Would it make the concentration look higher or would it make our concentration look lower? Let's give you a little pause again for you to think about that. OK, so it would look like you've actually used less acid than you actually have used. Right, so a couple of drops might go in there and uh, that might just, you know, look like you've got a little bit more acid in after the titration than you actually should have. You've added a little bit to it. So let's go back then to our calculation. So it looks like we've got less acid in it. Or we've used less acid. So this value is now going to be looking smaller. And the, uh, the effect of that then is that then your concentration is going to look like it's a little bit higher. All right, and the examiners will ask that. So I'll say, what's the error uh, in this titration? And then what things could you do? Uh, what, what effect would that have on the concentration? Which is always quite tricky to think about. OK, and then we've got one other thing that you might want to think about as well. The distilled water. I wonder if you can think about why I've put a picture of distilled water here. Well, I want you to think about the uh, conical flask. As you're adding your acid and you're swirling around, what can happen is your reaction mixture can actually swirl up on the sides here. And therefore, then basically there you've got sodium carbonate up here that's not being reacted. OK, so you get to your end point. And you've, you know, neutralized it, you've got that 
point where you've got your indicates change colour. And you think, right, I've just added the right amount of acid to get rid of all that sodium carbonate. Well, you actually haven't, OK? Because you've still got some sodium carbonate up here. So it looks like we've used a little bit less acid than we actually would have to use because we haven't neutralised stuff on the side here. And so if you use a little bit less acid, that would mean it makes the acid look a little bit more concentrated. So the way we get around that then is we typically, uh, once we've got close to the end point, and we think we're at the end point, we just rinse the sides of the conical flask down with a bit of water. Now that doesn't matter, don't worry about, you know, I've changed the concentration, it's, it's not gonna make any issue at all. We rinse the sides of the beaker down, and then just have a look at your indicator, make sure it hasn't gone back to being yellow. If it has, that means you've washed some, the sodium carbonate down into the conical flask and you're going to have to neutralise it by adding a bit, a bit more acid. I mean, the effect's going to be very small, but examiners are going to you know, look for you kind of being able to think about these things. OK, so just showing you there, that's um, a good idea about the, the end point. You know, you want to start off as being like this yellow solution. Um, and you can see here that it's gone this kind of pinky colour. OK, what you don't want to do when you're doing your titration is go too far and get to this red colour. It's going to be really important for you. OK, so uh, that's the end of the presentation. I hope that's been really useful to you. Um, like I say, uh, you know, I have covered various things there with you today. We've covered um, making up a stand solution. We've covered up um, how to do a titration. We've done our moles calculations. We've looked at working out our percentage error. And um, we've also talked about, you know, the typical things that examiners might ask you when we're doing about titration, what, where your errors come in and how they might have an effect on your overall concentration. So I hope that's been uh, useful and like I say, look at the other uh, sessions we have. We have sessions, uh, four sessions this uh, um, round, uh, but we do have other recordings as well that are available on the Carlham site uh, or a school. Thanks very much.